Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lauren Gilbert. I am the Senior Manager for Public Services here at the Center for Jewish History. Before I start, I'd like to thank the Leo Beck Institute, uh, one of the five on-site partners of the Center for Jewish History, for co-sponsoring this program with us. If you joined a little early, you saw a slideshow of upcoming programs. For more information or to register for any upcoming programs sponsored by the center or our partner organizations, uh, you can go to the calendar on the center's website, which is cjh.org. Uh, and we can also drop a link in the chat to the calendar page. Uh, and that reminds me, the chat function is turned off for participants today. So if you have questions for today's speaker, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll get to as many of the questions at the end as we can. Uh, feel free to type them in as we go along. I'm going to have a discussion with the author, and then uh, we'll look at a slideshow of some photographs, and then we'll move to the Q&A. Uh, so let's get started. Let me introduce Leah. Uh, Leah Garrett is a professor and director of Jewish studies at Hunter College CUNY. She has published four books in Jewish studies, including Young Lions, How Jewish Authors Reinvented the American War Novel, which won the Jordan Schnitzer Award for Modern History and was shortlisted for a National Jewish Book Award. Her new book, X Troop, The Secret Jewish Commandos of World War II, was just published on May 25th in the US with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt uh, and in, with Penguin Books in the UK, where it is already a bestseller. Uh, and we will put a link in the chat uh, to the Amazon page to purchase the book. Of course, feel free to purchase it from your favorite bookseller. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Leah. I know you've had a busy few weeks. I have, but it's really nice to be here. So thank you for organizing this. I'm very excited to talk about the X Troop. Great. And I mean, I know a lot of stories are marketed as you know never before told, and that's not often true. But in this case, it, it really is. So. For a lot of people who probably don't know this history, just tell us a little bit about what is the X Troop. Okay, so in 1942, uh, the, the Brits were really struggling during the war and they made a decision that they would create a new top secret form of commando unit. And it was called Inter-Allied 10 Commando. And it'd be comprised of, all, of a Polish unit and a French unit. And along with this, what they decided they would do is also create a German speaking unit. And the German speaking unit would be used for two things. One would be trained as commandos. So they'd be trained to kill and capture Germans. Two is because of their German fluency, they would be able to do on-site interrogations of men as they were captured in the heat of battle to get information immediately to figure out what to do next. This type of thing had never existed before. And so when they decided to do this, they tried to figure out who will these people be? And it was immediately clear to them who, who these German speakers were because there was a large community of German Jewish exiles who'd come to the UK as teenagers um, from Austria, Germany and Czechoslovakia and Hungary who all spoke fluent Germany and whose parents had made the decision, the most terrific decision in the world to send their kids to the UK generally on kinder transport or other methods. So, there was this group of these men who came by themselves, who knew everything was getting destroyed that they loved in their home countries. When they arrived after the war broke out, the British decided that they would um, call all of the German speakers or German exiles enemy aliens. And they ended up interning about 7,000 German Jewish enemy aliens. So these were these young men and suddenly they found themselves in these horrific internment camps, which I can talk about later, all over the world. They were eventually given the option to get out of the internment camp if they joined the military. And these guys were desperate to join the military, but the only military they were allowed to join was the Pioneer Corps, which was a hard labor corps where they build bridges, but we don't get to have guns. So they agitated and, and told the people in charge, we want to be in the proper military. Eventually, sort of Churchill and others figured out there was this brilliant, fluent group of men. And they started to pick, take them out of the Pioneer Corps. They brought them to MI5. They did deep interviews of all of them. And then they picked a unit, a, a bit less than 100 men. They trained them in Wales. And this was the real kicker. In order to be part of this commando unit, once they got to Wales or, or when they were still in the UK, 
they were brought in front of their commanding officer, who was this amazing Welsh gentleman who they all grew to love. And he knew if any of them were captured, they would be killed immediately for multiple reasons. They would be killed as commandos, they would be killed as Jews, and they would be killed as German enemies who were fighting the Germans. So he made the decision that they all had to take on fake British personas. They were given about five minutes, walk in the room, tell me what your new British name is. And all of them had to come up with these Anglican, Anglo sounding names. They had to invent backstories about why they had German accents. And then they were all given German, do do uh, sorry, British dog tags that were Church of England. So if they were killed, they were buried under crosses and many of them still are left under those crosses. They trained them and these men, as I'll talk about, were at the forefront of all the most important battles in World War II. And they made crucial, profound differences in terms of the Allied success. They were there doing everything. Um, but they but, never fought as a unit, right? Not as a troop together. Yeah, so once they started to train these men in Wales, they saw how committed they were, how physically capable they were, and how brilliant many of them were. The, the high command made a decision, look, we can't send the X troop out as one group because if a bomb lands, we lose like half of them or whatever it might be. So they made, again, a very unusual decision. No other commando unit was ever parceled out this carefully that they would only go in other commando units in twos and threes, and they would be the leader of each of the commando units. So they were there at the Sicily invasion at the front, at the front of D-Day, at the front of all the campaigns um, because they had this crucial thing that nobody else had, the German fluency, the deep counterintelligence training. Like one of them said, I knew the German military better than the Germans, and he, and he did. And as well, this burning desire, knowing that the clock was ticking and they had to beat the Nazis or their families would all be killed. And in a story you might ask me about later, one of them actually rescues his own parents from a concentration camp. Yes, I definitely yeah. I want to get to that in a bit. Um, and you touched on this a little bit with the internment camps, but a lot of this history is really kind of enraging. So uh, for those who aren't aware, can you tell us a little bit about the treatment of the Jewish refugees in England? Yeah, it's a terrible story. Um, just as a caveat though, look, uh, to write this book, I. Um, I went to archives all over the world. Like I went to the National Archive at Kew, the Imperial War Museum, Holocaust Museum, World War II Museum. I interviewed all the families of commandos I could find and also looked at all their own personal archives, which was tons of material. And I also managed to interview two commandos who were still alive when I was writing this. And a lot of interviews had been done of these men, but no one had done anything with them. So they all, I had tons of material. But something that was really clear to me was that the internment, though it sounds completely horrific and was, and I'll tell you about it, to them, that was a minor point. The major point was that the British let them fight and gave them guns and said, off you go boys, capture some Nazis. So the internment was, was horrific. So infamously Churchill said, color the lot when the war star started. And what he was talking about was this idea that there was a fifth column much as we had here with the Japanese internment of enemies within our ranks. And of course, German speakers look like the enemies. They never considered that like 95% of them were Jewish at this point, the German, they're all German Jewish refugees. And so they started to inter primarily young single men, which of course would be all the men of the ex troops. So they were basically all interred. They set up internment camps all over the UK, which were pretty bad. Some were terrible. But then they made the decision, God knows why, to send them also off for internment into Canada and in the very worst instance to Australia. They put them on this ship called the Denera ship. And I interviewed one of the commandos who survived. I actually interviewed before he passed away. And he talked about how the crew was infamously anti-Semitic. They were Brits. They were very nice to the German prisoner of wars. To the Jews, they made them walk barefoot over broken glass on the ship's deck. It was horrific, no water, people were dying. They got them to Australia. And then they decided to send them all on trains to the Australian outback and put them at a internment camp in the outback for a year. And the worst part about it was that they were not allowed to have any news. And these were all guys who were Holocaust survivors who had to know what was happening in Germany and Austria and nobody was telling them. So the minute the internment ended, 
and it ended after um, Pearl Harbor. They made the decision to end the internments. The guys came back and were at the front of the line to fight because of this. So tell us a little bit about uh, how that happened, the creation of the X-Tube and the selection and training. Um, so it's, it, it, it was, as I said, part of this inter-allied 10 commando unit. And it's so funny, the X troop was called the British troop because they had to pretend they were something. So somehow there was the British troop of all these guys with these very heavy German accents. So after M5 did a, M5, M5, MI5 did a very serious vetting and had a very, very, very picky about who they selected. They, they then did the thing of cha boys change your names and you know all of them were over the moon to get to fight back. One of them did a really funny quote, Tony Firth. He said, that was his fake name. He said when he walked in, he walked into the interview with MI5 and Brian Hilton Jones. And, and then when he walked out, they told him we want to use you for this special unit. He said, I walked in there not being trusted enough to carry anything but a pickaxe. And now you want to give me a Tommy gun and tell me to go fight the enemy who wouldn't be excited by that. So they were, you know, however, at the same time, clocks ticking and their families are all being murdered. So they're sent to Wales and because they're commandos, they're, this, this was, part of many bizarre and hilarious aspects. They're, they're all billeted with Welsh locals in the countryside. So these are like these German Jewish intellectuals. There was a woman who was billeted with them named Miriam Rothschild, who was working at that point on the Enigma campaign and she deserves her own book. And she was married to one of the heads of the X troop. And she said something like, where other commandos and soldiers in the British army were drinking uh, drinking beer, these guys were all discussing Schopenhauer. Like they knew, she, these, these men were completely different. So they're billeting with these Welsh locals. They're trying to pretend to speak English. These weird foods people are eating, these new customs. And most of these are very culturated young men from like Vienna or, or Berlin. Um, and then he puts them through the, Brian Hilton Jones who, is the father figure to all these men, puts them through the most brutal training he could come up with. He said that because he had lost a bunch of men earlier during the Dieppe debacle. And I mean, they had to do, I mean, it culminates with him having them all dropped off um, in the Scottish Highlands with no food, no money, no supplies and say, all right, boys, survive and get yourself back to London. And so they had to like eat berry, you know, it was like Sparta and one of them stole a motorcycle. It was just incredible. They had to do night campaigns. They were, they did practices where they were fired out with live bullets, jumped off of airplanes, scale, scaled mountains. Um, but when they were done, it was not only that they were capable but more importantly, they were confident and they all said the level of confidence they had. So they knew when they were landing at D-Day, they were ready to go. I mean, they were, they knew every, they did practice, you know, with all the different, all the different guns and bombs. I mean, just everything they could so that they would go in there efficient warriors. And that's what they were. And they were incredibly determined and brave in the battlefield because the clock's ticking. That's the main thing is the clock is ticking for them. Um, you did mention uh, the names of some of the archives you went to. Can you can you talk about your research process and logistical challenges you faced? I know you had to get, have a lot of files declassified, and, oh, and also, yeah. why are there still files declassified seventy years later, seventy five years later? Yeah, it was a blast actually, and yeah. some I got a lot of stuff declassified um, because it was a top secret troop, and because it worked through MI five, and it was complicated. But the real complication of this was. Because memories are fallible, as we all know, you can't just trust interviews when people recall what happened in war. Luckily for me though, the British army kept the most detailed war diaries of every single action. So when, it, so, but the complication was that because the ex troopers never fought as their own unit, but were parceled out to other units. So, so let's say I had an ex trooper in the eighties, doing an interview with the World War II Museum. Stephen Ambrose interviewed a bunch of them. And he says, well, I landed here at this time and I think this happened, blah, blah, blah. And, I, and you know, then what I would have to do is figure out which, which commando unit he was parceled with, go to the archive in queue, 
find that war diary for that day. I did this for every aspect of the book to make sure what they said was truthful to how the war actually played out. It was super fun. I mean, it sounds terrible, but it was actually very, very fun because I'd find, oh my God. And the thing that was astonishing, but not surprising because most of these guys were like supermen, their memories were incredibly accurate. It was very few instances where I couldn't collaborate how they remembered things with how they actually occurred. And then also, of course, I interviewed all the kids I could find of commandos and as well to two living commandos who were alive when I wrote the book. Um, and how did you choose the four men in particular that you mainly focus on? Um, I wanted I wanted a variety of types. So um, I have an Orthodox Jewish man. It was really important to me to have the sort of a Jewish narrative um, because that's been downplayed so much um, with these men. And then I also wanted sort of like an occultured person. So that's Peter Masters. He was an art student in Vienna. And then it was important to me that I covered the most campaigns I could cover. I didn't just want to cover D-Day in Normandy, which is where most of them were. And then so there was this third figure I focus heavily on called Colin Anson, who lands at Sicily and then goes through the whole Sicilian campaign, the Yugoslavian campaign, liberates Corfu by himself, um, as these guys do. So I wanted to cover all these different aspects. And luckily for the men I chose, um, there was tons of archival material. The Holocaust Museum had tons of material and the Imperial War Museum on these two. And they all either wrote um, biographies, they all either had biographies or autobiographies. So I had a wealth of information about the main people, but then I still focus on about seven others pretty deeply too. And how, how did they fare overall as a group in combat? Um, they had a very, very high mortality rate. And the reason that they did was um, something Peter Masters, who um, is one of the men I focused on said, and Anthony Beaver wrote this book about World War II where one of the things he talked about was like when, fair enough, when like young British soldiers were being said, hey, can you go out, you know, can you go to the front and like suss out the Germans? They were like, no, I don't, I don't wanna do that. But for the ex-troopers, it was the complete opposite. Peter Masters said, where all the other soldiers were drawing straws to see who got to stay behind, we would literally draw straws to see who would get to go forward. Mm -hmm. So they were always raising their hands for the most dangerous actions and doing it like over and over and over and over and over again. So what it meant was that during the course of the war, more than half of them like were killed or injured or missing in action, which is actually a very high rate. But it's because they were always at the front of everything. Uh, and the book is just filled with great stories that we started to talk about a little earlier. Um, like there was an ex trooper who got an entire garrison to surrender to him alone. And um, the story that you mentioned, Manfred Gans reunion with his parents. Can can you share a couple of stories with us? Um, sure. Why don't I? Let me, t why don't I, I'll tell you about one of the stories that I think um, the Forward newspaper actually just wrote about this today. So you can read it in more detail online. They, they took an excerpt of this story. And then at some point I do want to talk about the man for Gans story because that's its own thing. So there's this guy called George Lane, who's an ex trooper. He's originally from Hungary. He's very dignified, very, they called him the Hungarian hunk because he's super cute and super dignified. I think we have a picture of him later. He's the one who's married to Miriam Rothschild who is working in the Enigma campaigns. In the days before the war, Brian Helton Jones hears that the allied command thinks that there's a new type of German mine. And if that mine exists, they cannot do D-Day as planned. So they go to George Lane and they say, George, you're really good at, uh, with swimming can you land on the Normandy beaches and get us a mine? So he goes by himself first time, he finds the mine and he real, realizes it's just a standard mine. He comes back, he tells them, they say, no, 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 we've heard it's like a really different kind of mine. Goes a second time, reports it back, they get the same response. He goes a third time, the third time he's captured and he's a blindfold is put on him and he's brought after a long drive to a castle, they go. They bring him into the castle. This is before D-Day, and they say you better clean yourself up. And he's freaking out because he, you know, the commando addict means he's going to be killed if they know he's a commando. So he just pretends he's just a lowly officer, a low, lowly soldier. And they bring him into a room, and they find he finds that he's actually having tea with Field Marshal Rommel, 
And Rommel wrote a letter about this because I had to validate it because it sounded too insane. And they have a discussion together and George Lane, as he does with everybody, um, that's his, his fake name, charms Rommel and Rommel lets him go. They don't execute him. They leave him to lead him to a POW camp. When he's driving to the POW camp, he looks out the back and he gets a good visual memory of what the castle looks like. He has a blindfold, but he can see out the side and he sees what that castle looks like. When he gets to the POW camp, he walks in the door and he says, I'm Welsh. And they say, you're German, Steve, you're not Welsh. There's no way that's a Welsh accent. He tells them who he is and they rate, the, and he says, I saw this incredible castle where Rommel interviewed me. He describes it, a guy standing there says, because they have a library at the POW camps, I know that castle. He runs to the library, gets this book. He opens it, he says, is this the castle? He says, that's the castle, that's Rommel's HUD quarters. They um, radio it to London. London gets the message and shortly thereafter, Rommel's car is bombed as, as he strapped as he leaves the castle and he's out of the war. So that's one story, crazy story. Um, do you want me to tell you Manfred Ganz's story now? Um, well, well, why don't we move on? Is, is there a picture of uh, Manfred Ganz in the slide? Yeah, show? Many pictures of, uh, yeah there okay, are. So we, we talk about it then. Um, but that story leads me to another question, which is how pivotal were these soldiers in overturning Nazi rule? They were really pivotal in overturning Nazi rule. I mean, there's another instance where Peter Masters, the, this very sensitive Viennese artist who lands at D-Day on a bicycle because they put him with a bicycle troop. He ends up being on the first group to get to Pegasus Bridge, which is the most crucial allied position, Pegasus Bridge. Unlike the longest day, it was the bicycle troop with Peter Masters, a Jew from Vienna at the front to let them know that the allies are following. So, following. so they get this crucial bridge. Later on, um, Lord Lovett, who's this huge figure in, the, in British military history, he gets hit by shrapnel, Peter Masters saves his life. They continue on through France. And then when they get over the Rhine and they're doing the Rhine campaign later on, this is just one of multiple instances. It's Peter Masters who goes across the Rhine. He captures two German engineers. He has this photographic memory because he's an artist. And he, he notices some like badgy type thing on them, this weird obscure unit. And he says in German, you're part of that unit. And the guys quickly crack. And immediately they give him all the intelligence about where all the Germans are amassed on the other side of the Rhine. And as he's standing there, he hears the allied um, planes fly overhead and the ground shakes and they've bombed them and they continue the Rhine campaign. This kind of stuff happens all the time throughout the book where because of their German, because of their counterintelligence, because of their commando, and because of their burning anger, um, they keep making making crucial um, importance during the war. So do you think this story helps to subvert, subvert the notion that Jews didn't fight back? 100% subverts the notion that Jews didn't. Not only did they fight back, they were hard asses. I would not want to have encountered any of these men. Very ethical hard asses, but I mean, they were, Every, every commando unit wanted ex troopers because they knew immediately, oh my God, these guys are completely different. Even at the, the Normandy land, land in Manfred Gans, they land at, at, at Sword Beach, half of his entire commando unit, because they're parceled with other units, is immediately slaughtered because they freeze on the beach, which everyone does. People naturally freeze on the beach. But he's such a warrior, he remembers to keep moving he immediately captures 25 Germans and have, has them lead him and the survivors off the beach through the minefield so they can continue. Like it's constantly these types of moments, focus, determination, and, and German. Yeah. You talked a little bit about their motivation and you'd think they would be out for revenge given their personal histories, but um, that's not really reflected in their actions as, as you tell the story. So can you talk about the ethics of the ex-troopers? Yeah, I mean, the ethics are so profound for these men that I was talking to a professor at West Point about it, and they're going to use the X troop as a way to train soldiers at West Point because these guys all had to make ethical decisions. Over and over throughout the war, they had to make ethical decisions. And they were always on the right side because they their big thing was, we are not like the Nazis, we are different. We're gonna get rid of this evil. So, so there's one instance in which one of the X troopers 
has to interrogate the man who killed his mother. And he did a fair interrogation. Then he said he got drunk for a week afterwards. There's multiple instances like this. One of the men I talk about, the one who landed at the Sicily landing, Colin Anson, his dad, before he's put on a kinder transport, is taken to Dachau and murdered. After the war, these guys were really crucial in the denazification efforts in Germany and Austria. And he finds out quickly who it was who killed his dad. And he said in his biography, I could have taken that guy out to the woods and shot him, but we're not like that. And so he turned him in. And this constantly was happening, that they could have done revenge. They never, never did revenge. And there was a really nice quote. Um, I think it might have been uh, Manfred Gans to his parents, something like, we could never get adequate revenge because we could never be that cruel. Yeah, and that was the idea that we're diff we are we're, we are made of completely different stuff than these monsters. Um, let's move on to uh, some of the post-war experience of the ex-troopers, um, and how the experience of those in England seems to have differed a bit from those in the United States. Okay, and then maybe I'll tell you about Manfred Gans now because it was okay. Sort of great. So first, I'll tell you. Look, um, another sort of dark story aspect of this, not only the internment was that inter-allied 10 commando I mentioned, you know, had Polish unit, had a French unit, had all these units. Those units were naturalized during the war. The X troop was not naturalized during the war. And this was horrific for many of the men because they're stateless. They don't know, they have no, they have nowhere to land. None of them were naturalized during the war. Brian Hilton Jones, Jones constantly was fighting for them, but there were some people in the war office who did not want to naturalize these men. So after the war ends, again, the other commando units are, are naturalized. They're not naturalized, which is, I mean, we can only get, I mean, it's probably obvious why that was. And um, the, the British military again knows these guys are like incredible. We're gonna use them for denazification. So for the first year or two after the war, the majority of those who've survived are now sent back to Germany and Austria in order to capture Nazis. And one of them, Manfred Gans, is actually sent to his hometown of Bork in Germany, where he grew up as an Orthodox Jewish boy, had a very good Jewish childhood, but a very bad general childhood because once the, German, once the Nazis took over, they were terrible to him and all the Jewish kids. But he had a really strong Jewish faith and he like studied Hebrew and he was like, so they put him in charge of that town of Bork in Germany. And he knows who the baddies are immediately. He knows that he had a biology teacher who embraced racial anti-Semitism and abused the Jewish kids. He also knew that there was a mayor who tried to hide some Jews. So immediately he's given this, it's incredible, this position of power to parcel out what happens next. And then they put him in charge of one of the POW camps after this to interrogate high level Nazis, commanders at Auschwitz, it's unbelievable. And so he's the man doing the interrogation because he has the background, he has the German, and all of them together get crucial, crucial information for the trial, the Nuremberg trials. Mm -hmm. And then they all stay there for a year or two. Some remain there and keep working in the government. Um, so I can tell you about Mount Fergans more now, because this is like one of the, yeah, this is one of the craziest, most amazing unknown stories of World War II. So Mount Fergans, right? Orthodox Jewish, very intelligent young man from Bork in Germany. Parents send him away when he's a teenager to Manchester. He wants to be a, a, an engineer. He starts studying engineering at Manchester Uni University. He's interned really in one of the most terrible of the camps. He, he's Orthodox Jewish. He meets somebody at the camp who tells him he can't fight the Nazis because he'll have to break Judaism. Another guy there says, no, it's a complete mitzvah to kill Nazis. And that convinces him or verifies what he already knows which is he's gonna do this because he also knows his family, his parents who he loves so much are still back over there. He's at the forefront of the commando, commandos. Even during the training, they take him out to do extra counterintelligence training at Cambridge University. He does incredible heroic stuff at D-Day, Walt Karen, he does, he's just at the front of everything. He gets a letter though that his parents who have been hiding in the Netherlands 
have been captured by the Nazis and they've been sent to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. And he writes a letter to his girlfriend who, who will later be his wife. I have got to get this war finished so I can help my parents. So he's fighting the war not only for the Brits, he's fighting it because the clock is ticking because his parents have now been captured. In the final stages of the war, he gets a telegram that says his parents have been moved to Terezinstadt concentration camp in Terezin, Czechoslovakia. And he writes to his, his girlfriend and says, I'm going to have to get them. So before the war ends and the day before the war ends, when it's pure chaos in Germany, he goes to his commanding officer who has already decided this is a Superman because he's given him a very rare battlefield commission. And he says, you need to give me a Jeep. I've got to rescue my parents. The commanding officer says, no, <laughs> no. And he's very um, convincing and he agrees. So he, and they give him a driver and a Jeep and they set out in the last day of the war through completely apocalyptic Germany. I mean, there's like marauding troops, there's very angry, angry German civilians, there's German soldiers, there's, every, there's POWs, there's, and he keeps hearing this terrible thing when he stops for POWs who have now, are now walking down the roads very skinny and they, they all keep saying to him, and what they did to the Jews. And his stomach is just killing him. And he thinks, oh my God, I've got to get there really fast. He gets to the Russian side, right? Because it's everything still divided, which is now the Czechoslovakian side. He gets through Germany. He talks the Russians through. In fact, when the Russians are in terror, when he, one of them says, um, um, du bist a yid to him. And he can't, and he doesn't know Yiddish, but he knows German. And he says, y y yes. And, and then they're, they let, it's obviously a Russian Jewish soldier. They let him through. He gets to Terrazin, to Terrazin Stott concentration camp. He goes to the gates. These Russians cannot believe there's a British, a British soldier that far into Russian territory. It's, they say, Tim, why are you here? And he says, I'm, I'm here to rescue my parents. And they open the gates. And it's a complete hellscape. Um, he wrote a diary of this, which is in the Holocaust Museum. And dead and dying Jews everywhere because typhoid has now broken out. And he said he recognizes the faces because it's the faces of his childhood. He gets through to the camp office because of course they have a camp office. He goes inside, there's a young woman who I think was a Jewish woman. He says their names. I, I've come to find Moritz and Elsa Gantz. She opens a big roll book. She looks down and she just bursts into hysterical tears and just breaks down and says, they're still alive. Come with me. They get back in the Jeep. They're being kept in something called the Dutch colony because they were captured in the Netherlands. They take him to this apartment building. She goes to t warn them because he's terrified that they'll die if they just see him. He goes in and, and he describes the reunion in his uh, diary and it's, it's beyond words, but his parents are both, he doesn't recognize them because they're so skinny. They survived because his mom stole potatoes from the kitchen, but they're near death. Everybody is because typhoid's broken out. And immediately the, no, no, the, the word gets out at the camp that a Jew has lived, a son has survived, everyone is not dead and he's come back. The whole street fills with Jews yelling mazel tov. Someone even finds Passover matzah, matzah and they like make a feast. It's they talk all night long together. In the morning, he has to go because of typhoid. The Russians say, you have to go, and the parents are too weak to leave. He gives them all these supplies, including lots of cigarettes that he brought, because that's what you trade with, even so, and tons of food. And, and all the people, he gets, he said, like 500 letters are given to him for pe from people who say, give this to the Red Cross so we can tell people we're still alive. Gets back in the Jeep. War has been declared the day before, drives back through Germany, goes to the Netherlands because it's the great Manfred Gans. He immediately gets a meeting with Princess Juliana of Netherlands, who's just come back from exile. And he says, you have got to go to Terzenstadt concentration camp and rescue the Dutch colony. They're in really bad shape, typhoid's there. She organizes immediately and his parents are out safe and sound uh, within days and they survived the war. We have a photo later of them in Israel. So
And he said at that point, he wrote a letter home to his girlfriend at that point and said, I just won my own private war because they were all in two wars. They were in the big war and then they were in this other war. So um, it's such a great story. Um, let's go back to the, the post-war experience for a minute. Um, and why do you think the experience of those who remained in England seems to be a little more fraught compared to those who immigrated to the US? And it seems like those, those in England seem more likely to obscure their Jewish heritage publicly and privately, um, in many cases, even hidden from their own children. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I've thought about it a lot. And look, it really played out in the 90s when some of the surviving commandos decided that they would create a memorial to the troop in Aberdyfee, Wales, which is where they did their training. And the people who organized it, commandos themselves from the next troop, did not want the word Jewish on the memorial. And there was a huge fight. And on one side was Monfred Gans and Peter Masters, who I've mentioned, who said, we're a Jewish troop of the 87, maybe two weren't Jewish. Everyone was Jewish. And the other side came up with a whole range of reasons. Well, the Welsh would feel betrayed to know that we were actually Jewish, which su suggests its own things, or well, we were all part of the British or army. Or, and, you know, most of them were from assimilated families and they were not raised religiously, but right. So there was a huge sort of battle amongst them. One side is Peter Masters, who's now emigrated to the United States and is raising his kids Jewish. Monfred Gons, who was Orthodox and is now he's conservative, raising his kids Jewish. Miriam Rothschild, that woman I rec rec spoke of before, very proudly Jewish. And on the other side is a is a majority of the surviving commandos and they don't have the word Jewish on the memorial. Uh, and it was real, but it but it was it wasn't sort of like a side to the story. It was the story. Because after the war, I think I think that there almost none of them went back to their original names. Montfort Gons is one of the only ones who returned to his names. And I think it's because the names were so resonant of um terrible tragedy for them. It was the name of their dad or their mom. That was the, the last name. And at the point at which they were becoming men, they became commandos. They, they were kids. They were like 18 years old. They take on this persona. And I also wonder, particularly in the UK, because the, the experience there was very different from in the United States, where generally the Jews who came to the United States were much more okay telling their families they were Jewish. I think there was a strong sense that you couldn't be British and Jewish. Like you had to sort of, you'd, it was probably safer for you and safer for your kids. That might not be true, but it was a feeling um, that this side had to be sublimated. And the majority of them who survived lived in the UK, didn't tell their kids they were Jewish. And I mean, when I was interviewing commando kids, I always said like, how did you find out you were Jewish? And one of them, like this was very, very typical. One said to me, it was really weird. Like I had a cousin who was having a bar mitzvah and I was like, dad, what's this about? And then it would come out real slowly. Um, but it was, it was sort of, I think it's probably typical for a lot of GI, you, you don't, this is just somewhere you're not gonna go. But I think that sense of insecurity, anecdotally, I mean, I don't have facts on this, but what I see is that for the British families, it was much stronger than for those who came to America and felt that you could be American and Jewish as well. Um, before we move on to this, the pictures, um, do you can you think of any modern day parallels for the discri discrimination suffered by the ex troopers and any lessons we can learn from it? Um, well, I've been I've been I've been saying this recently, primarily because CNN has asked me to write an editorial about the ex troop, and they were like, which is going to come out I think next week. I don't know when it's going to come out, but soon. And they said, like, what's the main lesson you learned from the X troop? And, you know, I was re I've really been thinking about this because, look, I was writing this book during the Trump years. I was writing this book when there's been such an increase in anti-Semitism and it's been hor horrible. And I was writing this book at that time. So on the one hand, it gave me so much hope to see this group of miscasts and Jewish outcasts who could literally change the course of the war. But what also reminded me was they're all refugees. And so the main thing I've been, and what I wrote for CNN about it was that there's such a direct story on how important refu refugees can be to better the world in which they come. Why? Because what they bring with them is the deep knowledge of evil. And that's what they all had. They knew what fascism was. They knew what it did. 
They knew that this was not okay. And even after the war, all of them devote their law, every single one to some kind of social justice, whatever it might be, fighting segregation in one's neighborhood, whatever, whatever it is. Um, so the thing I get out of it is this importance of, 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 of bringing in people who come from that world to tell us on how to make our world better, 100%. And also with the rise of, that I'm really horrified about, the rise of anti-Semitism, I keep thinking about um, these families and these men and also realizing that this sort of story of optimistic story of Jews fighting back, I think is really important right now too. Thank you. Um, I, my colleague Ty is gonna help us out with the slides. So there is the American cover and in the middle is Jeff Broadman who was one of the great ex troopers with his, what he said, his great love, his Tommy gun and he's holding it right there with a bunch of the ex troopers. There was very few, um, images of the ex-troopers actually in battle. So I'm concluding most of them. Okay, next please. And this is the only group portrait we have of the ex-troop. This is when they're in Wales and the guy right in the middle is Brian Hilton Jones. And this is all the guys during training. Most of them, not all of them made the picture. Next please. And this is a photograph of the Isle of Man internment camp, which was actually one of the best of the internment camps because they were given their own little apartments. Um, but I wanted you to get a sense, as one of them said, about what it felt to be behind barbed wire again. Uh, next photo. And on the top right is Peter Masters, the guy on the bicycle, who um, is a focus of the book. And I got this extraordinary photo of him in the Pioneer Corps. And this is going to be um, after his internment and before he is selected for the X Troop. Of course, doing what they did, which was carrying logs and doing that kind of stuff. And none of them were allowed to have guns, which made them crazy because they just wanted to get back to Germany and fight. Next, please. And that's training and everything, all the training they did, they had to do with machine guns or jumping out of airplanes with rappelling. Um, and a lot of it was mountain climbing, rappelling and breaking into things. They constantly had to break into things because that's, they would have to break into German you know, apartments or whatever to get important information. And a lot of it was done blindfolded at night, so on and so forth. So I thought that was a good photo. Next, please. And that's the great uh, Welsh, uh, Brian Hilton Jones, who the men um, loved and saw as their father figure. And he took really good care of them um, and loved them back. And he wasn't Jewish. He was just a fierce warrior and he wanted his men to be the best. Next, please. And that's Colin Anson, um, who landed at Sicily, who I mentioned, whose dad was killed at Dachau, um, and who um, made that moral decision during denazification not to kill the guy who'd killed his, his beloved dad. And he ended up um, living his life in the UK, raised his kids as Church of England. Next, please. That is the great uh, George Lane, who the others called the Hungarian hunk because they thought he was so cute. He was married to Miriam Rothschild and he was the one who got the Teller Mines and, and he had a citation, I forgot to mention this. Um, he got a military, no, he got a military, I think he got a Victoria Cross. I can't remember which award he got. And it said, because of the actions of George Lane, the invasion was able to go ahead as planned. So because of what he did, they were able to do D-Day. Next, please. And that's uh, Peter Masters again, now in his commando unit. And they all had to have fake army regiments on, on their insignia so that they had a second story if they were captured. Next, please. And if you can see in the back, those are the bicycle troops carrying these foldable, terrible, terrible bikes that they were all for forced to carry um, to, to rush forward and get to Pegasus Bridge. So you can see them there. Next, please. Uh, and that's uh, Morris Latimer, who was a Jewish socialist hero on the right. And they've just captured this Nazi stronghold on the Isle of Walcheren. And because of him and Monfort Gans, they can end up getting the, the port of Antwerp. So it's a crucial strategic um, thing they do. But I always like this photo, photo, and I always mention this when I talk about this photo, that Peter Masters said about this photo, it's the opposite of the iconic photo of the little Jewish boy we all know with his hands up with the Nazis. And here we have a Jewish socialist with his, with his machine up 
to the Nazis with their hands up. So I, I just love that photo because I think it kind of captures it all. Next, please. And that's Ian Harris, who you mentioned, who just single-handedly talked the commanding officer of a German platoon into surrendering um, at Osnabrück. And, and that's the great Manfred Gans, who was just a complete Superman, the Orthodox Jewish man from Bork in Germany, who goes on to rescue his own parents and, and um, comes and does chemical uh, engineering at MIT and becomes a really important engineer in the United States. Next, please. And that's my favorite photo. It's his, him with his parents who he's rescued. He's in the back right. And that's um, Moritz and Elsa in German, uh, sorry, in Israel after they emigrate and have a very long, wonderful life. And those are her, his two brothers who also survive. Next, please. And that's Ron Gilbert, who was really crucial in the denazification efforts after the war. And, and I end with Ian Harris, who was the one who captured that platoon. I think that's the last one. And then we just have the book cover, I think. Yes. Oh, that's the British cover, because I know we get people from all over the world. So it has a slightly different title. Great. Thank you so much. So let's move on to some questions from viewers. Um, Zena is asking, was there any coordination between the X Troop and the Ritchie boys in the U.S.? No. And I've been asked that recently, because I know there, there was a 60 Minutes on, on it. They were completely different. The Ritchie boys and the X Troopers were similar because they were German speakers and were primarily Jews. The difference was crucial though. The, the, um, the Ritchie boys were counterintelligence officers. They were not commandos. The X Troop was this really unique and unusual thing, which was to be counterintelligence officers, right? So they, these were the guys in every commando unit who would do all of the interrogations, but they were also commandos. So they would go ahead of the guys behind and capture those Germans behind enemy lines and interrogate them on the spot. So they would be capturing and killing the Nazis and also interrogating them then and there. So they were completely different that way, but it was the same sort of population that was being utilized. Um, someone is asking, someone who is Welsh named Robert is asking if you know the location in Wales as well as the name of the commanding officer. Yes, it's Aberdeefy or Aberdovey. Um, and I have a whole chapter on the great uh, town of Aberdovey, Aberdeefy. I call it Aberdovey because the, boy, the boys did, but now it's called Aberdeefy. Um, and it's a beautiful coastal village in Wales. I was going to go there, but then lockdown happened. I haven't gone there yet. And that's where the memorial is as well. And the Welsh officer who was in charge was called Brian Hilton Jones um, as well. Um, a question from Laura, where did the men who survived settle after the war? We spoke a little bit about this and how many found families who survived? Um, not many found families who survived. Colin Anson did, whose dad was killed in Dachau because his mom was Catholic, but she was brutalized during the war because she'd been married to a Jew and she wouldn't divorce him, but she survived. Um, and I didn't even talk about this, but some of them, most of them were teenagers, some of them were adults, and many of them, I hate talking about this, but they lost their wives and children. One of them lost all three kids during the war. So they were, they were losing not only moms, dads, but wives and children as well. For those who survived, like I said, not many of them found remnants. Uh, Ron Gilbert, who I showed at the end, detoxification, he found his sister. Maybe they would find one person if they were lucky. Most of them stay in the UK. Those who don't, the rest make their way to the United States and Canada, a lot go to Canada. And almost none, as far as I can tell, make their way to Israel because I think they just want a quiet life after all this. Um, and a couple make their way back to Canada. I'm sorry, to Australia. So that picture of Manfred Gans with his parents, it's just his parents who- Yeah, he's just visiting them in Israel. He, he ends up in New York and then New Jersey, yep. Um, Judy is asking for their backstories. How did they explain their German accents? I think um, they had a, a large variety. I don't know how believable any of it was. Um, usually it was that the nanny, their nannies were German speaking or that their dads were businessmen and they were raised in Germany. Um, but I always like to mention this thing, which I, 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 I heard a bunch of interviews of the Welsh people who were billeted the boys um, and they said, they always like to joke among themselves that when we ask the ex-troopers, who are you? They would say, we are English. 
So everybody knows, noticed <laughs> this thing, but they all had these stories. And according to the Welsh locals, they all knew something was up. And the head of the police there just kind of said, let's, you know, let's just be quiet about whatever this story is. Um, but at one point, Miriam Rothschild um, is actually arrested as a spy um, because her husband, George Lane, is out of town. And she's, she's a great naturalist. And she's decided that she's going to find a new type of honing pigeon for the war. And she has a bunch under her bed. She has a bunch of sort of code books because she's working for the Enigma campaign and they arrest her, but eventually they let her off because her brother's very big in MI5. But people, you know, Brits are very, tended to be very polite about it. And people, one of them said later, one of the Welsh people said later, something like, we just felt so sorry for these boys because, you know, we knew, we knew the story wasn't good. About and they could probably pass among the Germans, but not among the English, obviously. Yeah, no, they could not pass. Yeah. Um, let's see. Holly is asking, did um, what Scottish Highland towns they trained in? Um, her Har men of Harlech is Harlech. I can't remember the towns. It's all in the book. Yeah. Um, but there was two or three where all of the commandos were training. So with Lord Lovett, they did some training up up north, but most of it was in Wales. And uh, Jay and Marcia want to know, are there any Jewish commandos still alive today? So um, when I was writing the book, I, I found the whole network of commando kids who were incredibly wonderful and generous. And first I found that there was one guy alive named Paul Streeton, who became a very famous economist who people in the audience are probably going, oh my God. Um, I gave a talk at Oxford today and one of his Oxford fellow professors came along and he said, it was funny, Paul was, was with us at Oxford and we never, he never talked about it. So luckily I was able to interview him through his daughter. He unfortunately passed away a year ago. And then when I was writing the book, I heard that there was a commando still alive in the United States. And, I, and he didn't want to talk to anybody about any of this stuff. And I kept trying to reach him. Finally, he agreed to take my phone call and I talked to him about the book. I flew out and I interviewed him and he said that he would be interviewed for the book as long as I never told anyone in the book what his real name was because he kept his nom de gore after the war. He had never told anyone that he was Jewish, that his parents had been killed in the Holocaust, that he came from Germany. And so I agreed to that. So in the book, I do a pseudonym with him. And unfortunately, I just found out he passed away about two weeks ago. So as far as I know, unfortunately, there are no more uh, commandos. So I, I'm, I was so lucky to get to write this book when I wrote it and get to interview two of them. Uh, that's really sad uh, to me that, you know, he felt that this was a shameful secret, you know, 75 years later. Yeah, and I interviewed him for the Holocaust Museum and I, I cause I knew how important this was and, and I, and he, he I signed something saying that for five years, we have to keep quiet about his original name. So he's in the book, but I use it. I say I'm using a pseudonym for him. I, I think when he was talking to me, I just felt he'd never talked to anyone about this stuff until I was there. And I think it was just literally too painful for him. I could see this is a place he didn't never wanted to go again. And he, and the, I think that was the real reason for it. He didn't want anyone to ask him about his family. That's what I think it was. Um, Nina is asking, how did you hear about these commandos? I had sort of heard rumors about this, about some, I, I knew there was some sort of Jewish commando stuff. There was stuff on the internet, a article here and there about it. And I got really interested in it because I'm obsessed with World War II. And then I had this incredible moment about three and a half years ago where I was trying to find more than articles and where is the book? And there was no book. And I thought, oh my God, <gasps> I get to write this book. And immediately once I started to contact, like find one commando kid, it led to another. And it just, it was so quick. And, you know, finding all the archives, it was sort of like it was hanging there in the ether and someone got to write this book. And I got incredibly lucky and I got to be the one to write it. So I was waiting to be written. Yeah. Um, and, and I got to tell, I got to do it. So I was... Um. Glad you did. Thank you. And the families were so great. So um, Nancy is asking, are these photos in the book? Yes, there's about 60 photos in the book. So that's just a few of them. Because what I found was all these families had all these photos 
Holocaust Museum has a bunch of them, Imperial War Museum has a bunch, and the families. So a lot of the stuff just came straight from the families too. Um, a question from Michelle, who says she can attest to the lingering anti-Semitism among the older generations in Britain. Uh, her question is, how did British intelligence not realize that Jews, especially Germans, were not going to be the UK's enemies? I honestly think that it did not even occur to them to think that these Germans were Jews, because there's no other way it makes sense. Because when they decided to call them all enemy aliens, they start to make these like four different type of enemy alien, like the ones that are okay that we don't have to intern, like married women or whatever, married men. And then they would do the ones that are really suspicious, which are single men, but never was the conversation about origins or roots or where they came from or why they were here. It was simply that, I think the idea would have been that somebody could pretend to be a German Jew, but they were really a Nazi in disguise. And this was really hot stuff in the press at this point don't trust these immigrants. I mean, it resonates with stuff today, doesn't it? Um, and so it just, it, it didn't matter. Yeah. Um, Carol wants to know which one of the X troop is your greatest personal hero? Oh no. That's a tough one. It's like choosing among your kids, few, right? I have a few personal, I have, I have, I would say three standouts. Manfred Gant, oh my God. Wow, the determination, getting his parents, he's just well, like whenever I'm stressed out or whatever, I think like what would Monfort Gans do? None of this would be a problem. He would excel at everything. Monfort Gans, um, Peter Masters, this incredibly sensitive, beautiful artist who sent on the bicycle troop, no training, and it, it becomes a master commando. And just the transformation of him was so beautiful. And Ian Harris, because I'll tell this little anecdote about Ian Harris, because I just love him. He's the one who was leading the Jeeps forward with the hundreds of men. He loved, as he said, I love killing Nazis. He didn't have any of the poetry of other, any of the other men. He had been brutalized and abused by Germans as a kid. And he wanted to kill the guys who brutalized him. Like he was completely direct. He lived a really great life. He died in his nineties. Um, and when, I, I, there's a picture actually I saw of him when he met the queen because was, he was the head of the commando association. And he said to the queen, oh, I hear your husband's a foreigner like me. So he was like, totally great. When he dies, he went to his son, Mark, who was really helpful in me writing this book and said, Mark, when I die, I want you to do something at my funeral. And so Mark says, okay. And it was a very proper British military funeral and they did the last rites. And then at the end of all this, very proper, Mark stands up because his dad says to, does the two-fingered salute, which is the middle finger in the United States, and yells out, up yours, Adolf. And I just thought, that guy, even from beyond the grave, oh my God, what a complete hero. And he did that, and it was reported in all the newspapers. So there you go. So those three just, I felt totally head over heels for those in particular. Um, Eric is asking where your article on the importance of refugees is being published, and also who went on to Australia. Uh, the article on refugees is being published with CNN. I think sometime this week or next week, it's about ex-troopers teaching us about refugees because that's the main lesson I got out of it. Only a couple went to Australia. I don't remember their names, but I do want to say, um, because none of them were the focus of the book, but those guys who go over on the Denera, they end up being really important in, in Australian culture after the war. And there's this whole cultural movement called the Denera Boys. And those were the ones who didn't come back to serve in the military. A lot of the guys who were in turn decided to, to stay there. And because they're Viennese, they're great cooks and they bring cooking to Australia and culture and all this stuff. So there's this whole myth of the Denera Boys in Australia because the guys who stay over there and don't go back end up being like these cultural Viennese, sophisticated, Berlinian, Jewish intellectual leaders, which is really cool. Um, it's coming up on five. We'll maybe take a couple more questions. Um, Mark is asking about Brian Hilton Jones, about his background. Uh, how old was he? Did he have any issue commanding a group of Jews? The Jewish thing was totally unimportant to him. And, and nobody talked, to, they never talked about themselves that they were Jewish, right? Because they're all doing this persona. So he knows that, it's sort of like, they didn't they didn't take them into the troop because they were Jews, they took them in the troop because they were German speakers, but those guys were all Jews and they were the ones who wanted to go back and fight. Um, he did like, he was brilliant. He did like 
a, a, I think a degree in modern languages at Oxford. He knew four languages. His family was in Egypt, so he knew Arabic as well. He was fluent in Germany. He did graduate degree at German, in, in German. And he just was a standout commando and he kept getting you know, greater and greater responsibilities. And then thank God for history and thank God for these ex-troop guys. He's the one who gets selected to oversee these guys. And when I interviewed the still living commando um, who I talked to, who does the pseudonym, the most important thing he wanted to show me was the letter of recommendation that Brian Hilton Jones had written him because it was really clear to me he became their father and he protected them. He fought for them to be denaturalized. Um, and he, he, he was the heart and soul of the whole unit. Unfortunately, he died very young in the 50s along with his kids in a car accident. So, but his, his, um, his daughter-in-law was really helpful in writing the book and shared all her personal archives with me. Okay, I think we'll take one more question. We're also gonna put uh, in the chat a link to a really quick um, survey. Your feedback helps us evaluate and plan future programs. So that would be very helpful. Um, so Holly wants to know who picked out their names and made up their biographies. That's a great question. So they're basically lined outside the office door. Brian Helton Jones is in standing, sitting inside and he says, come in with the new names. And then he says to them, but don't all of you be Montgomery because Montgomery is this big figure there. So um, Colin Anson picks the name Anson because as he goes in, there's an Anson um, plane flying overhead. A number of them pick names that are similar. So Paul Streeton was Paul Hornig. A lot of them pick names of their favorite teachers. And when they were you know, flummoxed, which happened a lot, like Manfred Gans, he walked in and, and Brian Hilton Jones says, what's your name gonna be? And he says, well, I'll go with Fred because Monfred is like Fred, I'll go with Fred. And he just has a second to think about it. And Brian Hilton Jones says, let me open up this phone book or whatever. A, a, I don't know what the term for a phone book was, but let me open this. He puts his hand down and they get gray, Fred Gray. And what's really interesting is besides Monfred Gans, all of the rest of the kids keep like, all the kids and grandkids I interviewed for the book, they have the names from that moment, very proudly. They were very proud of them, totally arbitrary. Um, and the backstories they were asked to come up with themselves. Thank you so much, Leah. It's such a great book. I recommend it to everyone. And thank you for taking the time out of your day, Leah, and for everyone watching. Um, and thank you, Lauren. And sorry, and thank you for the Center for Jewish History and the Leo Beck Institute. This was wonderful. I'm so pleased I got to do it. And thank you for the great questions. Uh, and this program is being recorded, and the recording will be available on the Center's webpage and YouTube page within a couple of weeks. And we'll send you out a link to that when it's available. So thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank Take you. Care.